Signore e signori, onorevoli colleghi. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable colleagues, today we are uh, united here to convey the Sakharov Prize for the Freedom of Thought to Alexei Navalny. The empty chair in this hemicycle is here to symbolize once again, unfortunately, that uh, the laureate of our prize has uh, no freedom. And uh, with our great bitterness, Alexei Navalny cannot be with us today because he's unjustly being held in a, pres in a prison of the Russian Federation. But Darya Navalny, who is the daughter of Alexei Navalny, is here with us today. She is here to represent him, together with the head of cabinet, Leonid Volkov. And Kira Yarnish is also here. Uh, she uh, is uh, the press attaché of Alexei Navalny. On behalf of all of you, we would like to express uh, our uh, welcome uh, to you and uh, to thank you for being here with us today. But I would like to ask you to, uh, to take a look at a video dedicated to the Sakharov Laureate of this year. Russia is being run as a kleptocracy, as a regime which primary purpose is corruption, is to squeeze funds from wherever possible. And when someone like Navalny tries to prevent it, that's when human rights violations start. And then thousands of people are arrested at protest rallies. What Alexei Navalny has done recently goes far beyond the particular issue of fighting corruption. It's no longer just a fight against corruption, but a fight for basic human values, a fight for life. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable colleagues, 2021 is the year in which we celebrate the centenary of uh, Andrei Sakharov in his peaceful struggle to promote human rights, his cor courageous uh, uh, fight against the Russian and Soviet regime. Uh, is the prize that we developed and which we are going to be handing over today. Andrei Zakharov would probably be sad, but maybe also proud, to know that for 30 years since the uh, fall of communism, the prize of which carries his name is being given to Alexei Navalny, his compatriot. But if this bitterness and sadness can be motivated because the political regime in Russia today is uh, to be blamed for the prevention of organization of civil society, to limit uh, freedom of the press, to uh, put uh, political opponents in prison without any doubt, without any doubt, Zakharov would be proud, proud of the determination with which Alexei Navalny is fighting for human rights and for fundamental freedoms. The courage that Alexei has shown uh, is uh, something that causes admiration and surprise. He's been threatened, he's been tortured, he's been poisoned, he's been arrested, he's been incarcerated, but they have not been able to actually make him uh, stop speaking. He has been fighting tirelessly uh, for the Russian people. He's an activist fighting corruption. He was a candidate, a political candidate, and he's a blogger. 
and he's a lawyer. In other words, his, his action for the freedom of thought, uh, freedom of expression, is here today and clearly recognized by us as an absolute value. As uh, he himself said uh, uh, once, corruption prospers if there is no respect for human rights. And I believe he's right. I think that the fight against corruption is a fight for the respect of uh, human rights, of universal human rights. And it is surely a fight for human dignity, for good government, and uh, for the rule of law. And in order to defend these principles, which Alexei uh, has been put in prison and has almost lost his life, he's a political prisoner. And on behalf of the European Parliament, I uh, call upon his immediate release and unconditional release. Come, come ogni anno. As every year, I also urgently uh, call upon uh, uh, all those uh, that need to be released, those laureates who received the Sakharov Prize who are still in jail. Ilam Toti, Nazrim Sotude, Aymara Nieto, Radif Badawi, Sergei Ziganuski. Nikolai Stavkevich, two uh, laureates of the 2020 uh, Zakharov Prize, and they have been unfairly um, condemned yesterday by the illegitimate government of Belarus to 18 and 15 years imprisonment. This isn't a shame, because amongst the hundreds of political prisoners in Belarus, there are four Sakharov Prize laureates, Maria Koleskanovia and Alex Bialitsi. And other laureates of the Kras of Sakharov uh, Prize are suffering vexation, Dr. Mokwebe, who has to face up to an alarming increase in of intimidations and death threats. This is also uh, true for Memoriam, the 2009 uh, Zakharov Laureate, one of the uh, m most uh, uh, ancient voices uh, for, uh, protect for human rights in Russia. This is also uh, subject to a process of liquidation. In a world where uh, authoritarian regimes and populist forces are uh, attacking human rights and are uh, calling into question fundamental rights. All these uh, Sakharov laureates and amongst them, of course, Alexei Navalny, all of them are showing all of us that with their example, through their example, what uh, it really means to fight for freedom. They are a source of inspiration for all of us who dream for a better society, a fairer society in Russia, but not only in Russia. The European Parliament will uh, make all the efforts necessary to support their battles and to protect them. The, and I myself in the European Parliament are hoping impatiently for the day when Alexei Navalny can come to the European Parliament, can come back to actually personally uh, receive the Zakharov Prize. And now I shall be giving the floor to Ms. Navalnaya, the uh, members of the European Parliament, uh, all the member states of the European Union, uh, some of them may be remotely linked, are very uh, uh, impatient to listen to your words. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you. Thank you so much. This is truly incredible. Before I start my speech, I 
wanted to tell everyone how incredibly grateful I am to be here accepting this award for my father. And at the same time, absolutely terrified. Uh, this is a big honor for me to be able to stand here in front of all of you. Um, and as a 20-year-old college student who doesn't know much about politics, I'm very much afraid and anxious to mess this up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you. Um, when I first heard that my dad, Alexei Navalny, was giving the Sakharov Prize, I was extremely happy for two reasons. The first one, this is a tremendous honor, recognition of his merits, and a high praise of the work that has been done and is continuing to be done by him and his co-workers. And most importantly, it's a, single, it's a signal to those tens of millions of citizens in my country who are continuing to fight uh, for the better fate of Russia. I will also name the second reason, although it's a little frank and awkward. Uh, my father is receiving this award from the European Parliament, and when you receive such an award, you get to come and speak in front of the European Parliament. Uh, unfortunately, for obvious reasons, he wasn't able to be here today. And I thought to myself, well, I guess someone better run and get that ticket to Strasbourg and seize the opportunity to come and, well, um, see this wonderful thing for myself. Um, and over some time, I realized that this might actually be what the nightmare of myself and my family looks like. Me traveling from different, to different conferences and summits, giving speeches in my dad's name, Sometimes he's even awarded something, uh, but I'm the one traveling. I'm the one writing the speech and starting it with a joke um, while he's in jail. And I will continue traveling, meanwhile reading articles about the horrible conditions my dad is being held in. It's not like there's much to do about it, so I travel and speak, and he continues to be held in confinement. And this doesn't only concern Alexei Navalny. We're the last year's uh, laureates, the Belarus opposition now, mostly in prison. Where's the 2010 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Lou Siabo? He died in prison. And here I ask myself today, why is it so hard to free from captivity those who are fighting for human rights? Why are they still thrown in jail, not only all over the world, but in European, geographically European countries in the 21st century? Europe is great and almighty. The will of the European citizens is expressed by the resolutions of the members of the European Parliament, and those are precise, correct, and fair resolutions. They're supported by the United Kingdom, United States, Australia, New Zealand, and the whole free world. But those who are like my father continue sitting in prison, watching more and more of their allies being thrown behind bars. You know, I've heard this many times, and sure, I will again, maybe even in the corridors after this ceremony. You know, Dasha, they'll say to me, I understand why you're feeling this way, because it concerns your family and close ones, but in the real world, however, we have to be more pragmatic. And in those hallways, I'll nod my head and say, yes, of course, what else I can say? I'm a 20-year-old college student, and I don't feel very comfortable arguing with, ex with experienced and responsible pragmatics. However, here today, taking advantage of the fact that I have the microphone, um, no one will take it away from me, and I, have, I don't have to argue with anyone personally feeling impolite. I would like to oppose that pragmatism. This is the Sakharov Prize. Thank you. This is the Sakharov Prize, and Andrei Sakharov was probably one of the most non-pragmatic people on the planet. I don't understand why those who advocate for pragmatic relations with dicta dictators can't simply open the history books. It would be a very pragmatic act, and having it done, it's very easy to understand the inescapable political law. 
the pacification of dictators and tyrants never works. <laughs> no matter how many people try to deceive themselves, hoping that another madman who clings to power will behave decently in response to concessions and flirtations, it will never happen. The very essence of authoritarian power involves a constant increase in bets, an increase in aggression, and the search for new enemies. And those who once said, let's not push Lukashenko and continue the dialogue when he was beating people up and throwing them behind bars, achieve only that now, in order to sentence someone, Lukashenko has to stop a whole passenger plane. Another thing that pragmatists don't want to do for some reason, which urges them to remember about the expenses and economic losses, is simply to pick up a calculator and see how much their pragmatism costs in particular to the European taxpayers. <laughs> Years of flirting with Putin made it clear to him that to increase his ratings, he can start a war. How much will the war with Ukraine cost to Europe? Even now, with so many news on Russian troops coming to the Ukraine border, no one's really talking about it. No pragmatic trade cooperation will recoup the share of the direct loss that will have to be incurred not to mention the cost of the time of the Western politicians like yourselves have already spent on solving the problem instead of dealing with their own affairs in their own countries. One of the opposition leaders, Boris Nemtsov, is killed with shots in the back right by the Kremlin. And then comes the pragmatist and says, well, we can't do much about it. Let's limit ourselves to a tough statement and then continue the conversation. And then they'll kill the second, and the third, and the fourth will be killed in the center of Berlin, and the fifth in the UK, and then they also blow up some warehouses in Europe, and then they start killing with chemical weapons. And now we know is just, and what we know is just unsuccessful assassination attempts. How many were successful? We already know that a real terrorist group has been created inside Putin's special services killing citizens of my country without a hearing or a trial, without justice. They were close to killing my mother. They nearly killed, killed my father. And no one will guarantee that tomorrow European politicians won't start falling dead by simply touching a doorknob. And now, you're already inc increasing the police budget. You give a lot of money to special services, spend billions, on new ways to detect those toxic substances, and these are the consequences of pragmatism. Don't push it. We need to act carefully and not anger them, says the pragmatist. And tomorrow, dictators inspired by half me measures of the, Western, of the West will transport thousands of people to the border of the European Union forcing women and children to storm the fences and secretly dreaming of someone being shot or trampled in the crowd. Let pragmatists answer how much will, cost, will it cost Poland or Lithuania or the entire European Union. They will answer to me. What do you want? These are sovereign states. Uh, they have their own governments. Our cap capabilities are very limited. Are you proposing a nuclear war? Uh, to free the political prisoners? Of course, I don't propose starting a war. However, I will, not, I will note that although it's not successful, it has started, and it, there are real victims, and they're, and they're using both cyber and chemical weapons. The fact that European banks freely launder corrupted billions of Putin and his friends the yachts, the yachts of Putin's oligarchs continue being sensations on European Mediterranean, that 99% of top officials of Russia and Belarus directly involved in crimes are all still freely uh, allowed to travel in Europe, just like their families, are all sure signs that many of those who make decisions don't even try to win at least the small wars in this battle.
They talk too much and think about the realm of politics considering actions based on ideas and principles, which frankly are naive and stupid. And you know what? It seems to me that the problem is that the desire to appeal to the dictators again and again, not to anger him, to ignore his crimes as long as it's possible, is not a pragmatic approach at all. It's time to say it straight. Under the sign of pragmatism, there is cynicism, hypocrisy, and corruption. There is a constant war between idealism and pra pragmatism. There are fierce battles in the European politics, but even choosing the side of pragmatism shouldn't mean betraying your ideas. When I wrote to my dad and asked, what exactly do you want me to say in the speech from your uh, point, he answered, say that there is uh, that no one can dare to equate Russia to Putin's regime. Russia is a part of Europe, and we strive to become a part of it. But we also... Thank you. But we also want Europe to strive for itself, to those amazing principles which are at its core. We strive for Europe of ideas, the celebration of human rights, democracy, and integrity. And we don't want Europe of chancellors and ministers who dream of getting a job on the board of Putin's state-owned companies or sailing on oligarchs' yachts. <laughs> Today, on this stage, receiving this high, amazing award for my father, Alexei Navalny. I thank you, and through all of you, I welcome the Europe of ideas and principles. European Union is an incredible miracle created by nations whose whole history is an endless war with each other. Despite all the difficulties and problems, however, the EU has and will encounter, I believe that in its future, that one day my country will become a part of it. To finish the speech, I want to quote a great compa a compatriot of mine in whose honor this award was named. My destiny was in some sense exceptional, not because of false modesty, but because of a wish to be accurate, and I know that my destiny has turned out to be larger than my personality. I simply tried to live up to my own destiny. I hope we all have the strength to live up to our destinies. Freedom to Alexei Navalny. Thank you.